tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about tortuous tots and contagious conditions. Also, both of tonight's tales are Chilling Tales exclusives, meaning you won't have heard them anywhere else. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Kevin David Anderson and Blake Earl Ray are voice talents Paul J. McSorley and Eric Peabody. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Kevin David Anderson and is performed by Paul J. McSorley. In it, We'll meet the Warrens, a middle-aged couple faced with exhaustion resulting from raising their nephew following a tragedy. They bring the young boy to a doctor in a desperate search for freedom and relief from their all-consuming fatigue. However, as we may soon discover, freedom means different things to different people. Without further ado, I present to you The Interview. Your son appears to be quite exceptional, Mrs. Warren, Dr. Etheridge said, looking up through wire-framed glasses, his index finger pointing at the test results in front of them. He has the gift. Mrs. Warren leaned forward in her seat on the other side of the desk. He my son. She glanced to the side where seven-year-old Andrew sat on a leather couch, entranced by his Nintendo. My sister's kid. God rest her soul. Etheridge watched her make the sign of the cross, thin, withered fingers moving over her chest. Her face was drawn, eyes sunken. She looked as if she hadn't slept in days. Perhaps your husband should join us, Etheridge said, gesturing toward the door leading to the waiting room outside his office where his assistant, Mrs. Anderson, sat. I think you'll both want to hear what this institute has to offer. She glanced back at the door. Nah, I think he's happier out there. Got eyes for your secretary, he has. Dr. Etheridge cleared his throat, trying to ignore Mrs. Warren's comment. Whatever the state of the Warren's farm life rural marriage was, it certainly wasn't any concern of his. The only thing at the moment that did concern him was the boy. Can I have some ice cream? Andrew said without looking up, his blonde hair hanging over one eye. When we're done, Andy... Mrs. Warren said. She turned her tired gaze back to Etheridge, grimacing. Can we get on with it, please? Etheridge pushed his glasses up. Yes, of course. He leaned forward, glancing down at the test results. His scores are the highest I've seen, on all levels. Telekinesis, remote viewing. Mrs. Warren snickered. Those tests are bullshit, doctor. Finding stars and squiggly lines on the back of cards, bending spoons. He can do that nonsense in his sleep. There was a crash outside in the waiting room. 
It sounded as if Mrs. Anderson had knocked her file organizer off the desk again. Second time this week. I'm sorry, Mrs. Warren, you were saying? I've seen him lift a tractor and hurl it into the barn like it was nothing. Can I get chocolate ice cream? Andrew asked. In a few minutes, Mrs. Warren snapped. A tractor? Etheridge sat forward in his seat. Not just big stuff and not just out here. She leaned forward, placing a hand on the desk. He can move folks' insides, blood, organs, bone. Etheridge removed his glasses. What? Didn't that secretary of yours tell you nothing? She lowered her voice. It's how he lost his parents. Can I get hot fudge on my ice cream? Andrew said. Yes, in a minute, Mrs. Warren said, glancing back at the boy, then slowly turning back to Etheridge. The doctor that works on the dead folk, the... Coroner? Yes, he couldn't explain it. Explain what, Mrs. Warren? Why my sister and her husband's hearts were turned completely round, said it looked like they'd been spun like a child's toy. Etheridge narrowed his eyes, not able to believe what he was hearing. We didn't think nothing of it until Andy brought me a chicken from the barn for supper. Thought my husband had snapped its neck, but when I opened it up, it was like its gizzards had been put in a blender. They poured out like stew from a pot. Etheridge took a deep breath, sat back in his chair. He had seen this kind of irrational fear manifested before. The guardians of these unique children were often torn between loving them and fearing them. He brought his hands up behind his head. This is exactly the kind of thing that we enable our students to deal with. Society's misunderstanding of their gifts can cause all kinds of developmental problems. He sat forward, peered into her exhausted eyes. I can give Andrew a better life here, a meaningful life, one that... I don't give a mule's ass by what you can do for him, Mrs. Warren said through clenched teeth, lips receding, revealing discolored gums. Etheridge was caught off guard. If it's a matter of money... She slapped her hand on his desk. We didn't come here so you could help him. We're here so you can help us. Help you? Etheridge said. Mrs. Warren, you have me at a slight disadvantage. She narrowed her eyes. Thought you were smart. Thought you'd know how to fix this. People say you folks deal with this kind of stuff. That is why we come to you. Mrs. Warren, what is going on? Impatience rippled across her features. My husband and I died two days ago, and the boy won't let us leave. What? He's using those gifts, as you call them, to hold our souls inside these rotting husks, and it's painful, painful as hell. Etheridge chuckled. Oh, Mrs. Warren, please. Go on, she said, laying her arm out on the desk, palm up. You is some kind of a doctor. Find a pulse. Better just humor her for a few minutes, he thought, until he figured out what to do. Etheridge sighed and reached for the woman's wrist. His fingers instinctively recoiled as he touched her skin. She was cold. Real cold. Etheridge shrugged off his initial reaction, letting his logic once again guide his actions. He reached out and took her wrist his fingers feeling for the rhythmic sensation of flowing blood. You know the dead can't sleep, doctor, she said. I'm so goddamn tired. Never been so tired. Etheridge wasn't getting anything. He got up, moved around the desk, placed his hand on her neck. With his thumb, he pressed on her jugular. Nothing. Still refusing to believe, he leaned over, pressed the intercom button on the phone. Mrs. Anderson, will you go down to the ward and get me a stethoscope? He released the button and waited for a reply. None came. Mrs. Anderson, I need you... He suddenly broke off as the sensation of a dog sniffing at his crotch seized his attention. He looked down and saw Mrs. Warren drawing back, her nose still sniffing the air. Mrs. Warren, you wouldn't believe what being dead makes you hunger for, doctor. Etheridge stepped back, disgusted. 
The sooner he got the boy away from them, the better. He turned to move toward the office door. He grasped the handle and swung it open. Mrs. Anderson, I've been called... His mouth dropped open. His eyes bulged. Mrs. Anderson was sprawled on her desk, dead eyes staring at the ceiling. Mr. Warren was using his hands like rib spreaders while his face sank into her exposed cavity. Etheridge could hear the sounds of chewing. I'll make you deal, doctor. Etheridge spun around and found Mrs. Warren standing, her lifeless, hungry stare boring into him. You get Andy to let us move on, she said, and I won't eat you. Paralyzed by horror, Etheridge watched her walk toward him. His heart pounded and he thought it would burst from his chest. Mrs. Warren reached out for him and he tried to raise his hands, but they remained at his side, useless. She clutched his arms in her dead fingers and moved his stiff body out of the way. She then exited the office and joined her husband at the feast. Etheridge staggered back, not knowing where his feet were taking him. His heels collided with a leather couch and he plopped down into it. The beeping sounds from Andrew's Nintendo were just a bit louder than the sounds of tearing flesh, snapping bone, and chewing, resonating from the waiting room. He looked over at the boy, still peering intently into the glowing screen of the handheld video game. Etheridge took a deep breath. When he breathed out, he was no longer a paralyzed idiot and once again a world-renowned parapsychologist. Andrew, he began. The boy continued playing. Andrew... Are you doing something to your aunt and uncle? I don't want them to leave, Andrew said, not looking up. And why is that? Because everyone leaves me. His forehead wrinkled. My dog Skipper left. Mom and Dad left. They left me alone. Tell you what, Etheridge said. Why don't you come live here with me and why should I? He had never had to convince a child. It was always a parent or guardian that needed the persuading. Because... Because I have ice cream. Andrew stopped playing and turned to look at him. What flavors? Oh, let me see. There is chocolate, vanilla, straw... I like Rocky Road. Got that one? Well, let's take a walk down to the cafeteria and see what we have. What do you say? Andrew stared at Etheridge, considering... Any progress, doctor? Mrs. Warren said, stepping back into the office. Her husband was on her heels. Both corpses glared at Etheridge, hands glistening with blood, chins dripping. Dr. Etheridge hardened his tone and tried to appear firm. Andrew, you have to let them go. Let them go, right now. Etheridge could hear the dead bodies of the Warrens shuffling forward, and he tried to tune it out. He stayed focused on the boy, eyes locked. Putting a hand on Andrew's shoulder, he said, I'm not going to leave you. I promise. He brushed the boy's wayward strand of hair from his eyes. You can live here and have ice cream every day. Andrew seemed to smile. It was the first expression Etheridge had seen in the boy. But first, Etheridge said, seeing the Warren's shadows fall over the couch, you must let them go. It's not right to hold them on this plane. Do you understand? Andrew's expression soured like a kid being asked to clean his room. He then turned and faced his dead aunt and uncle. He blinked twice. Go away. I don't need you anymore. The corpses stopped moving for an instant and just seemed to stand there like marionettes whose puppeteer had fallen asleep. Then, their strings cut, they slumped to the floor their dead limbs intertwined as if in a farewell embrace. Mrs. Warren's tired eyes shuddered, then went still, her dead gaze locked on Etheridge. He could see the emptiness in that gaze, cold, vacuous, and he could almost feel the hollow husks rotting. Andrew hopped up, sticking the Nintendo in his pocket. Etheridge stood up slowly, eyes fixed on the bodies in his office. Can we go get some ice cream now? Andrew grabbed Etheridge's hand. The parapsychologist nodded, hoping to God that the cafeteria stocked ice cream. Being a diabetic, he had never noticed. Of course, we will go take a look. There is a chance that they have run out, in which case we will just... I hope not, Andrew interrupted. I haven't had any since Auntie and Uncle ran out two days ago. His expression became irritated. 
And that made me really, really mad. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Manscaped. Guess what? Father's Day is coming up. You remember Father's Day, don't you? That's the one where we celebrate that guy who was always around when you were young, who was never proud of you, whose love was always conditional. You know, that guy who was eternally there but never present. Oh, come on. I'll give you a hint. You know that guy in those dreams you have? The ones that wake you up in the dead of night in a cold sweat? Seized by a feeling of absolute mortal terror that no matter what you have done, are doing, or will do, there's no way you can ever truly escape becoming everything you hate about that man. Okay, now I see that you're getting it. Yes, I'm talking about dear old dad. And dear old dad's day is right around the corner. And just to be clear, I'm talking about Father's Day. And you've got one question to ask yourself. No, it's not at which point you stopped being you and started becoming him. By the way, dude, that's kind of messed up. You should probably talk to somebody about that. But no, what you should be wondering is what gift to get him. This benevolent gardener of life that planted the seed that is you. So, pressure's on, aren't you gonna get him? You know it's not gonna be easy because getting gifts for guys in general is kinda tough, let alone the bipedal squirt gun that shot slightly less than half of your genetic makeup, but that's no excuse. This is a sacred day, and you better hope your gifts impress him more than your accomplishments ever have. Ooh, I have an idea. How about a new lawnmower? No. Wait, he already has a lawnmower. Oh, I'm not talking about that kind of lawnmower. I'm talking about the Lawnmower 4.0 from Manscaped. And this baby does not cut grass. It actually cuts pubic hair if you hadn't guessed that already. Manscaped's fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents, thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. But I don't think my dad does that. I mean, he came of age in the 70s, and I have seen a few Ron Jeremy movies. Ah, that is an apt assumption on your part. And even though your dad hails from an age when pubic hair was indeed allowed to run wild, there is a certain affliction that comes in middle age that all men dread. Oh yes, I'm talking about smoke crotch, and the only known cure is manscaped. Trust me, those areas of hypomelanosis in your dad's pubic hair, they're gonna wish they'd never been born. Now let me tell you about this baby's bells and whistles. It comes with four adjustable guard lengths that are completely customizable. You got a 4000K LED spotlight that you can turn on and off so he can shave in the dark. Most impressive though, is a new wireless charging system using electromagnetic induction, which can help battery length last longer. Yes, you heard that right. But it needn't stop there. If you want to go all out this Father's Day with some stocking stuffers, Manscaped's got cologne, crop mop ball wipes, crop reviver ball toner, crop preserver ball deodorant. I'm telling you, your dad will look up at you with wet eyes, and he will say, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> Use code CHILLING. Don't forget... <laughs> that you came from your dad's balls. And it's time to show your original home some love with Manscaped. One more time, that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code CHILLING, C-H-I-L-L-I-N-G. And, of course, tell him you heard about him here first. Thank you for your support of this program. 
and of the sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed the interview as written by Kevin David Anderson and voiced by Paul J. McSorley. To find more from Kevin David Anderson, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kevin Horror, spelled how it sounds, all is one word, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you'll find links to follow him on social media or on his website, kevindavidanderson.com, as well as a means of contacting him. You'll also find an encoded link to his profile on Amazon, where via clicking it to purchase any of his amazing books, a small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we're proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. If by chance you decide to check out Kevin's work on Amazon, you won't want to miss his fantastic novel, Midnight Men, The Supernatural Adventures of Earl and Dale. As we'll learn in Kevin's collection of tales about these most unlikely of heroes, creatures of darkness are not confined to the shadows of the night. They're found on lonely stretches of highways, bustling college campuses, quiet suburban neighborhoods, and even pricey upscale day spas. In short, they're everywhere. In Midnight Men, you'll join Earl and Dale, a pair of burly truckers drawn to those that dwell in darkness. Monster hunters by default, they confront the evil fearlessly and with just a bit of humor. Vampires, werewolves, half-human spider demons, and those that prey on the innocent, they're all one step lower on the food chain thanks to the Midnight Men. So don't delay. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kevin Horror, all one word, and pick up your copy of Midnight Men, The Supernatural Adventures of Earl and Dale, and let Kevin know that Steve and the team at Chilling Tales for Dark Night sent you. It would mean a lot to us. Thanks again for your support of today's featured author and of indie horror. Now don't go away. We've got another scintillating tale coming right up as written by Blake Earl Ray and performed by Eric Peabody. In it, we'll be introduced to Detective Jeffrey Raymond, who finds himself sitting in a doctor's office at a crucial crossroads in his life. During his fateful visit to his local physician, he may just learn the hard way that infections come in many forms. Will he find answers at the clinic? Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you, The Corn Wolf. When children wish to go into the cornfields to pluck ears or gather the blue cornflowers, they are warned not to do so, for the big dog sits in the corn. The Golden Bough by James Fraser The detective stood leaning against the wall in the waiting room, fidgeting with a silver dollar coin. It was one of the bicentennial ones, large, flat, and well-worn from years of handling. He was walking it back and forth across his knuckles in a practiced routine. The detective's father had given it to him on his tenth birthday, and he had kept it with him off and on ever since. It was, for a lack of a better term, a good luck charm, but Detective Jeffrey Raymond didn't believe in good luck. He certainly didn't believe in it after 24 years on the police force and 11 years doing missing persons. His dad had always said that two aces was a start, but you had to play the hand. The coin wobbled a bit in its passage from finger to finger. Raymond felt the coin's variance rather than saw it. He was scanning his surroundings idly. The waiting room was small, but in a friendly, cozy way. There was a large pastel yellow couch and a couple of mint green chairs. On the far wall, there was a box of generic wooden toys next to a rack of magazines and kids' books. Somewhere, hidden out of the detective's sight, there was a white noise machine running so that the sound of sessions wouldn't come through the wall. Outside, 
Thunder rumbled, loud and close. Raymond looked out of the small window. The bottom had dropped out finally. Rain was falling in sheets. Wind was whipping through the trees that were huddled in a little strip between the parking lot and the highway. Their branches were shaking and slashing at each other, a riot of color and motion in the October storm. To his left, never behind him, the door to the little room opened. An attractive woman who had gracefully passed fifty, perhaps four years before, stepped in. She was short and slim with long, dye-kit chestnut hair that complemented her blue eyes splendidly. In different circumstances, the detective would have made a point to talk to her. As it was, he doubted a shrink's office was really the right time or place to try to flirt with women. The doctor will see you now, the pretty woman said, with a smile that revealed large, bleached teeth. The better to eat you with, my dear, Jeffrey thought. Thank you, I'll be right in. Second door on the left, the receptionist said, turning and exiting. The detective watched her make her way to her office, softly shutting that door behind her. With the woman out of sight, Detective Raymond padded the right hip pocket of his charcoal slacks. He felt the slight weight of the pistol in there. It was a little hammerless Smith & Wesson 38 that he had picked up a couple years back at a sporting goods store on a whim. Most of the time, the little five-round thing sat on the shelf in the closet, tucked away in a case. The detective didn't really bother with trigger locks or anything like that since it was just him around the house. It wasn't like he kept it loaded anyway. It was loaded now. The detective tucked his light blue Oxford shirt in a little tighter and made his way down to the office. The second door on the left had a little plaque beside it that read, Dr. Timothy Jarvis, PhD. Smart guy, Raymond thought. His hand instinctively went to his Smith & Wesson again. He took a deep breath and opened the door. Dr. Jarvis was sitting hunched over his laptop when the detective entered the room. He was typing leisurely, unhurried. He looked up, straightened in his chair, and smiled politely. The first thing the detective noticed was how simply big the man was. He had to be pushing 230 pounds and was easily over six foot three. His shirt sleeves were rolled back to show thick, well-muscled forearms. His hands were enormous manicured mitts with professionally trimmed and cleaned nails. He seemed to have been hitting the gym since the last time the detective had seen him. Raymond had, of course, seen the doctor around the precinct. He was not necessarily a regular sight, but he had been in there a couple times when they needed a counselor or a professional psychiatric opinion. Had he been a witness at a trial that Raymond was also a part of? It was hard to say, but it seemed likely. The doctor's eyes were not obscured by corrective lenses, as Raymond seemed to remember them being. Without glasses, they were a strange, almost amber color. They were sharp and incisive, taking Jeffrey in with a quick scan. The look on the doctor's face, combined with the quick appraising sweep, made Jeffrey's skin crawl. It was predatory. Don't get ahead of yourself, the detective thought. Please, have a seat, Dr. Jarvis said in a smooth, rolling baritone. Raymond did just that, sitting down on a long, white couch. The doctor took a seat opposite the detective in a tall, plush chair that groaned a little as the man eased his weight into it. Raymond's back was to the door. Behind the doctor was a bookshelf stretching to the ceiling that was full of textbooks. One of the books, presumably on child psychology, bore Jarvis's name. It was turned so that it took up its own place of prominence with the dark cover facing out. Written in gold below the doctor's full name was the title, The Corn Wolf, 
and other prescriptive childhood boogeymen. No point wasting time. So how do we start? Raymond asked. Well, how about you tell me? What exactly brings you in? I filled out that survey thing, the detective said. His breath was coming in shallow, angry sniffs. He stopped himself and purposely took three deep breaths. He had to keep his cool if he was going to get through all of this. Yes, the questionnaire, the doctor said evenly. He rose in a fluid, athletic motion and crossed the room. The man Raymond remembered from the police station had been decidedly more ungainly, chubby. He had always been pretty tall, but he was certainly not nearly this powerful and fighting trim. The detective shifted on the couch. You could take the shot now, Raymond told himself, looking at the back of the man's pinstriped shirt. Four shots center mass ought to do it. He'd leave one in the wheel. But he knew that he had to be sure, positive, before he did it. It wasn't the sort of thing one did lightly. His father had always told him to never point a gun at anything you weren't ready to shoot. If that thing was alive, you'd better be damn sure you wanted it to not be. Edgar Raymond, Jeffrey's father, had also been a cop. He hadn't risen up the ranks like Jeffrey had, and was still a patrol officer when he dropped dead of a cerebral aneurysm at 53. He had been a big man, not tall, but barrel-chested and thick-necked. Jeffrey remembered his hands, scarred, rough, and chapped. They were tough, working hands from a different era. But they were never violent hands, even when Jeffrey had misbehaved or his father had come home late from patrol, smelling like Tanqueray gin, cigarettes, and strange perfume. On those nights, his mother would fuss, shout, and pace. Edgar would sit on the couch with his head in his hands after the bedroom door finally slammed. Don't get married, Jeffy, he would say, knowing that Jeffrey was around the corner. Then, he would go to the kitchen and make a couple sandwiches, frying the bologna and the bacon fat they kept congealed in an old, chipped mug by the stove. Jeffrey and his father would sit and eat those sandwiches and watch the late-night movie on cable. Later, his dad would sulk into the bedroom, knowing the door was unlocked at last, and Jeffrey would cry himself to sleep on the couch. Dr. Jarvis found what he was looking for on the desk. He snatched it up, along with a spiral-bound notebook, and crossed the room again in a few long strides. He sat back down across from the detective. He shuffled the print out. Okay, so let's see, the doctor said casually. We'll start with your mood. How have you been feeling lately? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the best you've ever felt, where would you rate yourself today? I don't know. I guess a 3 or a 4. It's hard to say. I've never really thought about my mood on a scale. The detective surprised himself with his own honesty. He could have easily lied, but he was pretty down lately. And then there was, of course, the real reason he was here. Maybe he was losing it, a little, after all. Okay, the doctor said. Let's start there. What seems to have been the problem as of late? Are you feeling depressed? Angry? Anxious? I can only imagine the amount of pressure that you have at work. I've uh, been having a bit of a hard time at work. I can only imagine the doctor said with a little reassuring smile. Missing persons, is that right? Yes. And how long have you been feeling this way? How long would you say that you've been having a bit of a hard time, as you put it? It's been a few months, the detective said flatly. 
In reality, it had been almost eight months since the first incident. A missing child report had come in. The girl was gone from a house in one of the nicer suburbs, about a half hour drive from downtown. The parents were absolutely beside themselves. The kid was a 13 year old girl named Clarissa. She had disappeared in the middle of the night. The window to her bedroom was open, letting rain blow in and puddle on the hardwood floor. Officially, she was listed as a runaway. When Detective Raymond had walked into the room that first night, he knew something was off. This wasn't a runaway. The drawers on the tall, white dresser were open. There was a shirt hanging down from the middle drawer. Raymond crossed the room carefully. He looked at the drawer closely. He called a short, marine-looking uniformed officer over. Has anyone been in here? No, sir, the Marine replied. Where are the parents? The young officer led Jeffrey down a long hallway to a staircase and eventually the kitchen. The pretty woman at the table was too young to have a teenager, even a young one. He guessed she couldn't be more than 26. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying, but other than that, she really was a striking young woman. Stepmother, Raymond thought. The father walked into the room and joined the stepmother at the kitchen table. He was a slim, almost lanky man. He was pale, but it was hard to tell if it was from worry or not. He was holding two cups of coffee. He sat one down in front of his wife and took the seat beside her. The sight of the detective, rain soaked and rumpled from the walk up the long driveway, seemed to startle him. I'm Detective Raymond. Jeffrey said, extending his hand. The man across the table took it and shook it, limply. Jacob Dorsey, he said in a distant, distracted voice. This is Megan. The pale man gestured to the woman sipping her coffee from a mug cradled in both hands. Raymond nodded. Clarissa had disappeared earlier that night. The couple realized she was gone when thunder woke them up. The girl had been troubled and seeing a shrink. She wasn't handling the remarriage well. Apparently, Dad was supposed to stay single indefinitely. They had driven around looking for her before they called the police. They even went as far as to ride through the cemetery where Clarissa's mother was buried. That, in and of itself, had wasted a couple of hours. And in these kinds of cases, hours and even minutes were precious. They had no idea where she could have been. She didn't have many friends. Last thing, Raymond said as he got up from the table. Where's your dog? We don't have a dog, Megan answered, baffled. Clarissa's allergic. Oh, I just thought you might. Raymond walked back upstairs and stood outside Clarissa's door. Along with the typical smell of a teenage girl's bedroom, perfumes, scented candles, and the like, there was a heavy smell. It was musty and almost sour. It was the unmistakable smell of a wet dog. It was about a month before the next one. It was an 11-year-old girl from the same part of town. She lived in a gated community of big colonials. There was a forced entry. The girl's bedroom window had been smashed in. The glass had been lying in glittering shards across the beige carpet, interspersed with little splinters of wood. Whatever the perp had used to break the window, maybe a crowbar, had scratched up the wooden sill badly. The official line was that it had probably been the father. Dude was in dereliction of his child support, and chances were he had grabbed the girl and taken off down to Florida where his family was from. The mother took a little solace in that, apparently. She told Raymond that, despite how bad things had gotten between him and her, that he never would have hurt the girl. Raymond had stepped out back after talking to the girl's mother. It was an old habit from back when he had still smoked cigarettes. 
He was walking his coin back and forth across his knuckles. That's when he noticed something at the edge of the yard, a dark, glistening heap in the bright early spring moonlight. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. Things in life have a way of just piling up, especially the things you can put off. Things like the check engine light, why your dog won't stop licking his butt, getting that flu shot, fixing the garage door, using minoxidil on your scalp. Man, I wish I had been more on top of that one. Oh well. The point is, it's human nature to let these things pile up. And it's human nature to keep putting them off. And it's also human nature to feel stress and anxiety about it. And that stress and anxiety has a funny way of growing with the pile. Now, a lot of those things you can just cross off the list. Things like getting an oil change, getting your kids to school on time, getting your colon checked, getting your prostate checked. A uh, quick note to the younger gentlemen in the audience. You know how your butt and your bladder just kind of work and you don't have to worry about it that much? Well, just enjoy it while it lasts. All right, back on track though. All right, so the pile. Yes, you can be assertive, you can take care of it, you can disperse it. It'll grow again, but if you stay on top of it, good. However, the stress and anxiety, it doesn't always go away as easy. Sometimes it kind of sticks around, no matter what you do. And what was originally your brain's little wake-up call to keep you on top of things, just becomes the elevator music soundtrack to your life. And if you let it go too long, it can start interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals. But therapy, it's so easy to put off. The awkward waiting room, the bills, the scheduling issues. Well, it's a good thing BetterHelp's here to change all that. What is BetterHelp? BetterHelp is an online counseling service that is convenient, affordable, and 100% confidential. You don't really even have to leave your home. Though it probably would be healthy for you to get out now and again. You don't have to for therapy, at least. All you have to do is go to BetterHelp.com, and BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's so fast and efficient, you can be communicating with your counselor in under 24 hours in a safe and private online environment. How's that for convenience? In fact, you can message your counselor anytime to schedule video or phone sessions and expect timely and thoughtful responses. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp services clients worldwide offering a broad range of expertise which may not be locally available in many areas, making mental health care deserts a thing of the past. Just remember that BetterHelp is not self-help and it's not a crisis line. It is professional counseling done online. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. BetterHelp and I both want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com chilling. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. The detective glanced around. He was alone for the time being. He flipped his coin into his palm and clutched it in his fist. The cool, familiar weight was reassuring. The backyard was a long expanse of sea foam grass under a crystal white full moon. The detective walked slowly. The dark lump was stirring slightly right at the edge of a stand of pines. Raymond reached into his light jacket to feel the solid heaviness of his gun. It was a raccoon. When Raymond got close, it barely turned its head. The thing had been ripped open. 
The smell of the torn bowels and blood mingled in the air. The detective stared down at the poor creature, moving pitifully in its agony. The detective stomped its head. The crunch made his stomach lurch like he was going too fast on an especially hilly road, but the creature didn't move anymore. At least its suffering was over. Jeffrey leaned in close. Whatever had gotten a hold of this thing had really done a number on it. Must have been a bobcat or something of the like, since the little guy had been almost entirely disemboweled in long, jagged gashes. But bobcats and the ever more common coyotes ate their victims. They didn't leave them to suffer. Only people did shit like that. By the fifth disappearance, Raymond knew what they were dealing with, even if he couldn't bring himself to say the words, serial killer. The kids weren't being found. They weren't with estranged parents. They weren't running away. The detective knew, deep down in his gut, that the kids were dead. They were as dead as that raccoon. He had started smoking again. That's what he was doing on the night of the last full moon. He was sitting across from the house of a kid who had just started seeing the same shrink as all the others. He pulled hard on his Winston and sighed. The night was bright. The moon looked close and heavy, hanging in the unseasonably cold September sky. He was watching his little contrails of smoke and walking his coin across his knuckles, when movement caught his eye. The detective turned to see a hulking shape creeping up beside the big brick house. In one motion, the detective snapped his cigarette out into the night and drew his pistol. He sprinted toward the shape, but pulled up short. The thing, and it was a thing, Raymond realized as the motion-activated floodlights above the garage kicked on, was massive. The shape of it was sickening. It was heavily muscled and shockingly big. It looked like a bodybuilder covered in mangy silver and black fur that hung in lank tendrils from its naked, rippling form. Thick ropes of saliva swung from its jaws as it turned its misshapen muzzle toward the light. The eyes shined a bright, carnivore gold. The beast stood up on its hind legs, and Jeffrey gagged. The movement was athletic, smooth, and yet horrible. The body looked overstuffed. The skin pulled dangerously at the joints, a worn suit only moments from splitting at the seams. The general shape was that of a massive canine, but the hands and eyes were almost those of a man. Raymond unloaded nine bullets into the thing, the whole damned magazine. The thing screamed. It was an unnatural, infernal sound. It whirled its hideous body on a back paw and sprinted into the darkness on all fours. Lights were coming on all over the neighborhood. Someone had probably already called to report the shots. Jeffrey jumped into his car and sped off before the first siren. He had spent the rest of the night in a crowded bar, ordering diet colas and watching people drink. The idea of being alone was too much. His dad had once looked at him, half drunk and haunted, and told him that sometimes... A man is his own worst company, and for the first time in his life, Jeffrey understood what that meant. At last call, Raymond made his way home. He walked into the house and fell into the couch, all his strength going in one big sigh. He walked his coin across his knuckles for a while, smoking with the unoccupied hand. His thoughts were racing, insane. It shouldn't exist. These things don't exist. Had it seen his face? 
Did it know him? It was a bright night, but maybe the floodlights had temporarily dazzled it. The detective sat there until the morning sun flooded through the plastic blinds. After a second cup of coffee and a breakfast of runny, scrambled eggs and a fried bologna sandwich, the detective decided to make an appointment with the shrink, the same one the girls and their families had been seeing. He made it for a month out. He took the last appointment of the day on October 28th. And now, Raymond was sitting in front of the doctor, the thing that had been a doctor. There was no way out of the office if he was right. And what if he was wrong? There's really no way out either way, the detective thought grimly. He reached into his jacket pocket and found the silver coin. He rubbed it between his thumb and forefinger. What was it that happened that brought you to me today? The doctor was saying. Can you trace your depressed mood to an incident? Sometimes a man has to do things he knows will be hard, will hurt, but that's what separates good men from great men. Officer Edgar Raymond had said the day he had given his son a coin. Six years later, the man would be dead. And now, decades later, his shadow still stretched across Jeffrey's life. Detective Jeffrey Raymond took a deep breath and flipped the coin across the room. He watched it tumble end over end through space as he pulled his revolver. There were five bullets in it, five silver bullets he had smelted himself out in the shed, melting down and shaping them out of his grandmother's good silverware. Jarvis, or at least what had once been Dr. Timothy Jarvis, snatched the coin out of the air reflexively. His eyes went wide as he squeezed the silver dollar in his fist. The detective had a gun drawn, and the pain in the doctor's palm shot up his arm. He could smell the adrenaline in the other man's sweat. He screamed. The room filled with the heavy smell of burning flesh. It was an oddly familiar smell, although Raymond couldn't place it. The doctor opened his fist to reveal the coin sizzling in his palm. Little tendrils of smoke were climbing up to the ceiling. Dark blood was welling up from beneath the silver disc and spilling onto the floor. He scraped the coin off his palm with his other hand, revealing the burned and ripped flesh beneath. It was a gaping hole. Jarvis screamed again. As his mouth opened, his jaw distended. The sound of bones cracking and rearranging was as loud as gunshots. Skin stretched and pulled. The clothes the man was wearing split at the seams with a loud tearing. Long claws pushed violently through the tips of the doctor's fingers, ripping off the human nails and letting them fall to the ground like bloody flower petals. The detective froze with his index finger shaking on the trigger. The door banged open. The pretty receptionist screamed. Raymond turned to tell her to run, to flee for her life. The creature crossed the room in a bound, knocking the detective back into the couch, breaking one of the legs and sending the two bodies rolling into the floor. Raymond's ribs shattered under the impact snapping like twigs over his father's knee. The beast sank its teeth into the flesh by Raymond's collarbone, raking away half of his deltoid. Three shots rang out, only slightly muffled by the muzzle being buried in the thing's stomach. The creature drew back, heaving the detective's own blood and flesh into his face. Somewhere, the receptionist was screaming. The beast went limp. Raymond pulled himself out from under the bulk of the monster, groaning in pain. His chest was on fire with blunt trauma. His left arm hung uselessly from his destroyed shoulder. He pushed back against the wall, 
watching the creature for movement. There was none. At least two of the bullets had lodged somewhere in the thing's abdomen. There was one ragged exit wound near the humped spine, but there was only one. Raymond looked at the receptionist. She was shaking, her mouth open and covered with a well-manicured hand. Don't watch this part, Raymond said through the searing pain. The woman turned. It had to be done. It had to stop here. A good man killed the creature, but a great man would make sure there would be no more. Detective Jeffrey Raymond pressed the gun to his temple and pulled the trigger. I hope you enjoyed The Corn Wolf, as written by Blake Earl Ray and voiced by Eric Peabody. If you enjoyed Eric's performance tonight, I'd like to remind you that you can hear more of him on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, where he came in second place in our 2019 Evil Idol voice acting competition. You'll find a playlist for that competition on our main channel page. You can also find more of his voiceover narration and audio engineering work at his website at vikingguitar.com. If you check him out, be sure to give him a thumbs up and leave a kind word whenever possible and tell him you heard him here on this program. It means a lot to us. To find more of author Blake Earl Ray, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Ray, spelled R-A-Y, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on creepypastastories.com, where you'll find links to his official website, his social media, and his e-zine, Pulp Factory, a place, as Blake calls it, for people to get their art and stories out. And of course, you'll find his latest greatest tales there too, as soon as they're published. If you decide to drop by, let Blake know that Steve and Chilling Tales sent you. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you'll find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week, when once again we turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. 
We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.